Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Hill Country. My name is Donna Schloss and I am the service associate this morning. And I'm pleased to see all of you here to celebrate with us. I see we have a few visitors. Uh, if you would like, uh, you could raise your hand and introduce yourself or uh, we could uh, just move ahead. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, please raise your hand to Justin so he can unmute you. Not a thrilling raise of hands, so we will move on. We welcome today our speaker, Reverend Philip Shulman. Reverend Shulman is a graduate of Star King U, U Seminary and a lifelong ec ecology, peace, and justice advocate. In 1998, he directed one of the nation's first crisis alternative programs to reduce the use of force and violence in mental health crisis response. Surely we have seen in the last year that this is a very needed program. He served as minister to congregations in California, New Jersey, the Virgin Islands, San Antonio and Houston, Texas. As part of the UUA Green Sanctuary Program, he initiated a project that saw 35 congregations that planted over 3,500 trees. A UU consultant, he has facilitated programs on nonviolent communication to UU congregations and leaders. In 2017, Reverend Philip was hit by a truck while riding his bicycle. His recovery from this trauma has been an inspiration and he speaks on the post-traumatic spiritual gifts he received. So well, please welcome Reverend Philip Schulman who will give us our opening words. Good morning. It, it's um, a pleasure and an honor and I'm grateful to be with you again. And Hello and thank you to our, our guests. I'm the guest minister and uh, I use to talk to my guests as an opportunity to talk to everyone that we are coming together, just not for another Zoom meeting, for a worship experience, worship shaping our values, remembering our values, reconnecting to what's most sacred to us individually and collectively. So I ask you to join with us in a spirit of prayer, however, that's meaningful to you. And I will start with a blessing of blessed of all creation, holy one and holy oneness. We give thanks for this time together, for the technology that makes us possible and the hard work that makes us possible. And we may we be blessed in this time to be inspired and encouraged to do good work. Let's go. Thank you so much. Um, now is the time that we have our announcements. If you have an announcement, please raise your hand and Justin will unmute you or uh, put something in the chat and he will work off of that. Announcements, anybody waving? I see none. So then, let us move on to the lighting of the chalice. Fire consumes and casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets for the past, our fears about the future, our worries about today. May it light for us a path of joy and peace. Justin will now put our 
mission statement and affirmation on the screen. Please join with me in reading either aloud or silently because you're muted. Uh, the, our affirmation and our mission statement. We journey together guided by UU values to seek, nurture, and serve our loving church family, our community, and our world. The doctrine of this church is love. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. And this is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship as we strive to have all souls grow into harmony with the divine. Oh, so we're last in line, but we're anxious for all the rest of you who are ahead of us to get yours so we can get ours too. Um, I'll, I'll see what I can find out for you. So, but someone is in charge, someone is working on it. I can't believe that the health, that the number's disconnected, that I'm stunned. I think that's everybody. Okay. Our uh, reading this morning is by Barton Luther King, whose birthday we will be celebrating on Monday. And these words by Martin Luther King are as relevant today as they were when he spoke them more than 50 years ago. And the, the title of this reading is Extremists for Justice. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you murder the hater, but you do not murder the hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. The question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate? or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or the extremists of justice? By Martin Luther King. And now is the time for our offertory. Unfortunately, we cannot pass a basket to each and every one of you, but please remember that our house is a house of freedom it has been built and sustained by the gifts of its members. And even though we are not meeting in the house, we are still of the house. Please take a moment to send your offering to Judy Bunch, who is our treasurer, Mike Burkett, or directly to the church. And remember, it's a new year and a new time for pledges. Thank you. And now uh, we will have Phil, Reverend Philip will uh, lead us in a meditative reflection. Yes, I invite us all just to shoot a few short minutes, moments. Maybe if you're busy doing something, it's okay. That's what Zoom does give some advantages. But I encourage you to take this moment to come with your attention into your body. Very simple meditation, very simple reflection. If you can breathe in and exhale through your nose, do that now, however you wish. Just notice, breathe in, breathe out. Pause. Imagine something uplifting 
and notice the sensations. As simple as sunshine or a scene that you enjoy. But the key is feel it in your body. Celebrate, we celebrate. They're not just intellects or floating heads, heads on the screen. We have bodies. So center right here, right now, together as individuals and a congregation in peace and love. Blessed be. That was lovely. And now we welcome Reverend Philip to give us our talk on UU Traditions, a foundation for optimism in trying times. Where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Science has provided much useful information about the universe and natural processes. However, it isn't equipped to answer questions like, what is the meaning and purpose of living? Each religious tradition has provided guidance which influences the formation of values. UU congregations affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We approach the world's numerous scriptures as collections of stories and poetry. We find wisdom in scriptures without insisting they are God's literal words or accurate records of history. UU congregations embrace doubt, skepticism, reason, and science, seeing these as potentially helpful for spirituality and faith formation. Despite this embrace of our questions, many of us still have been reluctant to wholeheartedly claim our participation in religion. Many of us walked away from a religious upbringing and tending never to return. Those who were raised UU and those who came later stayed because we, we felt a sense of belonging. Often we made jokes to assert that UU wasn't, was really something else, not really religion. We thought about running ads that say, if you don't like organized religion, you will love our congregation. Truth is, being organized is essential for existence. And integrity leads us to admit that we are participating in a religious tradition. Religion? Huh? Who? Us? Well, if we look like a religion, walk like religion, quack like, like religion, could be. Some play an atheist card and say, I don't believe in the existence of God, so how can you say that I'm religious? I try to top them. Hey, I call myself a minister, and I don't believe in the existence of a religion. I'm serious. I don't believe there really is such a thing as a religion. Many of us, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, 
Buddhists, pagans, and even Unitarian Universalists like to pretend that we believe the same things and practice the same religion as did our ancestors. My studies in seminary and beyond, religious history, big biblical scholarship, literary criticism, literary theory, etc., made clear to me that beliefs, worldview, and practices change enormal, enormously over time. Groups may divide and go in different directions. Mormons, evangelicals, Catholics, and mainline Protestants all call themselves Christian. Are they really practicing one religion? Although beliefs and practices change drastically over time, groups revere the same scriptures as their ancestors, more uh, or less, with threads passed down over generations, religious people weave tapestries of faith. I prefer the term religious tradition. So what keeps us from proudly claiming our participation in religious tradition? One hurdle is the influence of religious conservatism. We have let them define religion for us. Fundamentalist religion claims possession of absolute truth, usually in the form of a book said to be the literal word of God the creator. The fundamentalist looks at other religious traditions as false, wrong, inferior, even evil. It sees other traditions as leading people away from God and or from truth. If we are honest, I think we will acknowledge that we are not immune from this tendency. When Europeans came to the Americas, they did not respect or even recognize the religion, spirituality, or faith of indigenous peoples. Natives didn't possess the book, also known as the Bible, or God's literal truth. Europeans viewed the natives as uncivilized and ignorant. The Unitarians and the Universalist traditions came here from Europe. Our two churches grew from the Protestant Reformation, relying on reason for interpretation of scripture. Although our ancestors were people of the good book, they held ideas considered heresy by dominant forms of Christianity. They proclaimed the humanity of Jesus and salvation for all. The Unitarian Church formed during a liberal epoch in Spanish history when Jews, Muslims, and Christians lived in peace for a time and on the Andalus Peninsula even shared their holy books with each other. Greater generosity, UU you, 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 liberalism grew greater in the mid 19th century when Eastern religion reached us through the transcendentalists. Unitarian Reverend Emerson asserted that people could have communion with the divine through nature. This led eventually to our modern Unitarian Universalist movement, which claims multiple sources of inspiration. If we no longer have one book we identify as the true guidebook, can we be called religion? Yes, we're just not seen as such by fundamentalists and by the fun fundamentalist thinking 
in our own minds. The Enlightenment and the Protestant Christians that conquered this continent have dominated American views on religion. Religious identity came to mean which version of the book does your group follow? Religion became equated with belief system. 20th century consumer culture has made religion into a purchase choice where you choose between competing belief systems. In this view, you, you, you choose your religion by which group you believe has the truth, the truth about God, about life, and about living. Our tradition is skeptical of any claim to absolute or final truth about God, living, and life. We suggest that all groups can enrich life, contribute to a journey toward wholeness or truth. We value lifelong education. Enjoying learning together is part of our reason for being together. We say that revelation is continuous. Equating religion with the, the following of a rule book ignores the fact that religious texts are largely a collection of stories. Storytelling is a part of the way culture informs the next generation into its way, values, and worldview. We look for wisdom in sacred stories because we appreciate the art of religion. We also value reflection, doubt, and questioning in our religious journeys. We value science and reason and see them as essential for our faith. We wish to grow in awareness of the interdependent web of existence. We've strived to grow in consciousness, ethical or spiritual power and wisdom. Have you heard what you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian Universalist? You get someone that knocks on your door and ask what you believe. When I first heard that joke, I really disliked it. I thought we would surely come out on the bottom in the competition of religion. To win, we needed to confidently present our persuasive art of argument, never admit we are wrong or don't know. To me, the, the UU knocking at the door sounded lost and clueless. I learned that religion doesn't have to be a competition and we are not clueless. I have come to appreciate the value of curiosity and looking to each other to find better answers. Of course, there are times we need to share our beliefs and our thoughts. UU religious tradition encourages us to be willing to engage in controversial topics. Do have convictions. Just remember to be open to new learning. Shifts in mind and heart. We put faith and expect greater outcomes to come as a result of collaborative efforts. Our tradition encourages, encourages us to say our peace and work for justice, knowing that often people will resent us doing so. Raise questions, express concerns, and practice good listening. In this time of polarization and divisions, it's easy to imagine our efforts being met with animosity. Sometimes it might seem 
like there's no point in trying to talk to them. To me, one of the great hopes of our UU tradition is the affirmation that it is possible for people with greatly different worldviews to be able to talk about what they believe or don't believe and why. When I first visited a UU congregation, I was 23. I was a child from two religious families. Three of my aunts on my mother's side of the family were nuns. On my father's side, what my one aunt was a pillar of the reformed Jewish congregation in our family hometown. People were curious and baffled. How could both Judaism and Catholicism live in a family? I was taught to respect people's religion and I'm grateful for that guidance. However, the peace was kept by not talking about things. There was conflict in me. And later in life, I concluded that anti-Jewish attitudes are embedded in Christianity. My first UU minister had been ordained in the Dutch Reform Church. He got in trouble when he opposed the American War on Vietnam. When he became the president of clergy for reproductive rights, his church fired him. The UU Fellowship provided Reverend Pontier a free pulpit. His sermons talked about following Jesus and openly rejecting the doctrine that Jesus' crucifixion was atonement for our sins. The fellowship impressed me as a congregation outspoken on issues of social justice. How do we speak out and act effectively today? So much division and animosity. It's hard to imagine finding a way to get beyond the constant red versus blue, us versus them. It's always, it seems it's always win, lose. Win, win doesn't even seem possible. People are yelling over each other and nobody seems to be listening. It's easy to justify behavior when you're sure your side is right and good and the other is wrong and bad. You know who loses in that situation? We all do. I will try to be the you, you at your door asking what you believe. We know our tradition asks us to speak up and act for peace and justice. How shall we do that now? What steps can you imagine taking together? How does your congregation already exemplify the changes that you want to see in the world? When have questions been offered in respect? When have you listened well or been listened to well? How could this congregation support learning and demonstrating that Black Lives Matter? How else might you help build a world that experiences there is enough for everyone? As a guest minister, I aim to encourage and challenge. The real deal will emerge from the people willing to roll up their sleeves, willing to share resources and take risks together. People who spend time together, who listen, build bridges, who are committed to see the congregation, the country, and the world 
move forward together. What I can offer is the good news that ours is a tradition of hope. From our ancestors arose inspired theology of hope, human dignity, and divine love. Our ancestors gave a liberal faith to a world where sermons like ben Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God were the norm, the fair. Unitarians emphasize Jesus humanity. They saw Jesus someone that pointed us pointed us in a to a divine way. With a human savior, power was in humanity. It was here not a world away. The sacred story of the universalist church was universal salvation. God embracing and reconciling all of humanity. The very notion is still radical. These theologies have inspired and added meaning to my life. Whether you're theist, atheist, agnostic, skeptic, dreamer, whatever, I believe that if we explore with an open heart and find me meaning and hope in these theologies, in this tradition. Some of us like the religious poetry that speaks of God. Some of us, not so much. We all know that beyond the limited way that we talk and understand life, there is more. Beyond our beliefs, beyond our knowledge, beyond our efforts, sacred life makes itself known. <clears throat> and how about that, you, you, knocking at the door, asking questions? We dare those who are willing to examine beliefs. We want to know if the story being told is a story that heals or harms. We can value curiosity and have the faith of a scientist. We can venture into new territory. We can encourage each other to think in new ways. We need not pretend that we have all the answers. When we claim to have the, all the answers, we deny uncertainty. Our tradition respects uncertainty and the limitless possibilities implicit in an uncertain future. We are learning that vulnerability is part of being alive. It takes humility to acknowledge that sometimes even our best efforts fail, even cause harm. Sometimes we don't know that things will go well. Our tradition reminds us that truth is greater than our stories. We can examine what we are telling ourselves we can explore how fear has limited us. We can find the power of imagination. Here, we get to decide what stories are sacred to us. We need not be limited by stories of the past. We get to tell new stories and write new chapters. We can trust that the truth, that truth is greater still. And beyond our striving, amidst the chaos and strife, stillness can be found. And with it, great things arise. Understanding, creativity, connection to values, 
meaning and purpose, a peace that passes understanding. When we see no way, faith says there has to be a way. Another way sometimes emerges from forces greater than our individual intellect. Sometimes we experience loss. Even when we face death, spirituality reminds us that we are part of something larger than ourselves. Our story fits into a greater narrative. Donna mentioned my recovery, recovery from a near fatal accident. I came through some pretty difficult and scary times. Fortunately, I have far exceeded what doctors and others imagined was likely for me. I drew upon various aspects of faith. Sometimes I used denial. It was just too painful to consider that I couldn't recover. I kept my focus on the next task before me. There were matter, matters of obvious consequence to me that I wasn't able to address. It's pretty scary. I prayed and I tried to trust that things would work themselves out. I knew that I could only do what I could do. In order to protect myself, from negative predictions, I grabbed the hold of a rebellious thought. No one knows what's possible for me. The truth of this seemed obvious and gave some relief. I didn't have to invest in my fear. Let's find out what's possible for me became my motto. I'm still using it. I think our UU faith is like this. Some people assert that these are the end times. Some deny the reality of climate change or otherwise thwart corrective action. Some scientists that I respect have made pretty dire predictions. Our tradition listens to science and we affirm that revelation is not sealed. And we love good questions. Questions like, who else has an idea that might help? What can we do to increase the chances of a good outcome for all of us? What could I do? And what, we, what could we do to move us one step closer to the creation of beloved community? Thank you, Reverend Philip. Now is the time we have for some congregational response. If you'd like to respond, please wave your hand or put your name in the chat section and Jason will unmute you and you may have your say. Go ahead. Anyone? Oh, okay, Vicki, let me get you up here. I am unmuted. Yes. Uh, hello to everyone and especially welcome to our guests. Um, Reverend Phil, I really enjoyed your sermon. I thought it was really thought provoking and, um, you know, in the early 1990s, I was part of a UU study group that was working on the 
Martin Marty, Reverend Martin Mar Reverend Marty's led a uh, project on fundamentalism. He's kind of a famous Lutheran theologian. And the one thing that I remember about that study group about fundamentalism is that all fundamentalism, whether it's Muslim, uh, Orthodox, Hebrew, um, Taliban, um, Evangelical, Pentecostal, whatever, you, you must have an enemy to be a fundamentalist. And I think that speaks to, um, I'm in this club and you're not, I'm right and you're wrong. I think that's where that you must have an enemy comes from. And one of the most um, important parts of our UU community and this congregation to me is how welcoming it is and how inclusive. I, I just think that that's a, such an important core belief that we have and that we express um, by welcoming a diversity in our uh, congregation, but also in reaching out to different parts of the community. So thank you for um, this message, the wonderful um, arc of your sermon that's, that gave me a refresher course in UU history, as well as some ideas about how to be a better listener. Uh, well done. Thank you for coming to visit our congregation. Thanks. Okay, Linda, let me get you up here. I did that so I could cough. I agree with uh, Vicki, very thought provoking. And as while you were talking, I thought how appropriate that you followed our service from last week where we discussed spiritual practices within our UU faith and whether we were a religion or not. Uh, <laughs> So uh, it really was a, a great follow on to that. And I thank you very much. So what did you decide? <laughs> well, Linda got muted again somehow, just a second. I propose that we were. <laughs> because we had a set of principles and practices and an organization to our, uh, to our, to our group. So I propose that we were, I use the actual definition of religion to compound on that, but, uh, and then we went into spiritual practices and it's interesting you talking about different religions as part of the Sunday service committee, we kind of feel like we've had a success if, 50% like our speaker and 50% don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that speaks to our, our differences, but, uh, but no one ever says, don't ask them back. <laughs> so I always feel like it's a thought provoking thing for those who didn't enjoy it as much as others who truly enjoyed it. Right. All right, Tina wanted to say something, go ahead. Um, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all. And thank you, Reverend Phil, for the invitation. Um, I, too, really like the sermon. Uh, I'm aware of my own attraction to UU in that I'm always questioning. Um, there's like, um, you know, certainty is kind of the enemy of curiosity, you, you might say. Um, and we, when you were talking near the end about what's possible, um, that was really inspiring to me, like doctors with many degrees, who knows, right? Um, and then the, you know, the climate crisis is, is something that we can hold as real and as a threat, and we can follow certain scientists and say, boy, I admire this person's academic, you know, <laughs> credentials, and at this is both, could they maybe be missing something? Could there be other possibilities? So, and that's true in every, all the um, areas you spoke of them. Um, uh, looking up to leaders and saying, oh, that person's gonna save us is not the same as uh, embracing our community, you know, what we can do together uh, that we, no one can do alone. And so I'm 
really inspired and, and grateful to be here with you all. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. All right, and Jill, let me get you up there. Reverend Phil, thank you for that excellent sermon. I do have a rather provocative question when you talk about us versus them and what do you believe? Recent events occurred with people whose behavior, regardless of their beliefs, behavior was pure evil. And some of those people were behaving probably in the name of their faith. And how do you reconcile with that, with that kind of behavior? You know, that, I think you have maybe captured the most central question in my sermon. And in, in, in that, that even when we speak about fundamentalism, it's very easy to make them the enemy and then we're off again, right? And so the, the answer that I gave was that, you notice I said, and the fundamentalist thinking in our head. So our tendency to see good and evil, to see us versus them, right versus wrong. And what I have learned um, through the study and practice of nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg is uh, a, just a different orientation. It's very challenging and it's about instead of um, who's right and wrong, who should be punished and who should be, who should be uh, rewarded, it becomes what is the need? What is the cry? What everybody's wants to be alive right? and we're saying, I wanna live. And some of the ways that we say this are not too helpful, you know, they're destructive. You can call them evil, but I prefer to say, and uh, there are sometimes things are abhorrent, I certainly agree, you know, but everyone is trying to survive, trying to live. And so how can we meet, how can we, we have to have boundaries, uh, but how can we hear the needs of all people? How can we make, everybody's needs matter and inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's nutrition. It's very, it's very, we don't get it. We don't get it as an idea. We don't reach it, but we can keep turning it back. And if we get more, if we get it more, if we can hold each other as one human family a little bit more, we'll be better, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Now is the moment that we extinguish our chalice and we extinguish this chalice, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth. Our closing words today are with love is my guide. Amidst the swirl of life's challenges, fears, and even moments of crisis, I make time to gaze at the night sky and see the vastness there. And to remember that this moment in time is but a flicker, not an inconsequential flicker, for what I do and think now does matter. My work though is to let the debris of this world pass by while I anchor myself in what I know is true. Love, kindness, compassion, and caring for this precious life and this precious planet and all that calls this planet home. This is my North Star with love as my guide how can I possibly go wrong? Thank you so much for being here with us today. <laughs>